next on Unsolved Mysteries. A man falls out of a boat and searchers can't find his body. He was set to be tried on rape charges. Is he truly dead or alive and on the run? Just two days before Christmas, a five-year-old boy and his young mother are brutally murdered. Can DNA left by the killer lead to his capture? In 1917, more than 70,000 pilgrims in Fatima, Portugal, saw what they believe was a true miracle. It remains one of the great religious mysteries. And after searching for more than 50 years, a man is finally reunited with his long lost daughter, the heir to his fortune. Whether it's murder, larceny, or foul play, sometimes these cases are solved, and often by people like you. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Snake River, Washington. After a late summer fishing trip, Strider Starfire and another man head for home. With night approaching, they're worried about getting back before dark. As the boat speeds across the water, Strider reaches for a beer from an ice chest. The boat driver claims he gears his dog yelp, and when he turns around, Strider is gone. He is never seen again. The apparent accidental drowning of Strider Starfire has been in question ever since. It wasn't long before investigators learned that Starfire actually had a very good reason to disappear. Strider Starfire was a family man. He, his wife, and their two young children live in the small town of Roseburg, Oregon. The teenage daughter of a family friend often spent time with them. We'll call her Lisa. Yes, can you help me? Lisa had grown up without a father, and she became like a second daughter to Strider and his wife. Those who spent any time with Strider would usually fall under the spell of his incredible charm. So it's about 1,200 hours, you know? Me and Tim were in this foxhole, all right? And we're pinned down, we can't get up, and we were trying to get our He told romantic tales about his exploits while serving with the special forces in Vietnam, spying for the CIA, or fighting alongside the Irish Republican Army. When he told us about being this crusader to help the little man, to pull the poor guy up by his boots and, and give uh, the underdog his day, you tended to believe him. He wove his stories very well. So the reason why we're called the Clan of Starfire is because... Strider also claimed that he was the last surviving member of a Scottish clan and was the sole heir to its fortunes. You should. As Lisa grew up, she spent more and more time with the Starfire family, and Strider always made himself available to her. He was a father figure when she had no father figure. She had no qualms of believing and feeling safe with him because he'd always been safe. I gotta tell you. But according to Lisa, those feelings of trust and security were destroyed one night in the Starfire home. I'm in love with you. Out of the blue, he started to profess his love to me. Tell me he'd been in love with me for years. That was, that was a really terrifying moment. After making his advance, Starfire allegedly seduced and then had sex with Lisa. For more than a year, the traumatized teenager didn't reveal what had happened. 
the secrecy took a heavy toll. After Strider did that to me, my life really spiraled out of control. I couldn't make any friends at school, so I quit going. And I did a lot of drugs. And I decided that I couldn't, couldn't deal with it anymore. Strider's behavior became more blatant in other ways. One day, he brought home an unexpected guest. He introduced her as his new business partner. I had been getting a little bit of rumor that there was more than just business going on between them. And when they came home, it was exceedingly obvious that they were being intimate. Who the hell is that? Are you out of your mind? His wife was shocked when Strider proposed that she welcomed this woman into their home as his second wife. That was the last straw. Within weeks, she filed for divorce. But it wasn't until after their divorce was final that Strider's ex-wife learned the true depth of his lies and his deceit. Lisa left a note saying that she was running away with her boyfriend. She also revealed the dark secret that she'd been keeping all these years. Hello. Starfire's ex-wife received a call from oh, no. Lisa's Hi. stepfather. He said she left a note, and in the note, she states that Strider molested her. No, I just... And I was torn between like disbelief and belief. Lisa returned home the following day, but Starfire's ex-wife was still grappling with the disturbing revelation. I was just overwhelmed with everything that had happened. I'd just been through a whole time during the divorce of finding out that he wasn't who he said he was, that the last 11 years really had nothing to do with reality. Strider Starfire was formally charged with felony rape and sexual assault. And then authorities learned from Lisa that there might be more secrets to uncover in the Starfire home. When going over her case, she brought up another uh, girl's name that she was aware was living there at the house during that time she was. Um, that's when victim number two was brought up in this. Years earlier, a girl we'll call Debbie had often babysat for the Starfire children. This victim was in the ninth grade at the time that she was first seduced by Starfire. I'm going to go back and I'm going to uh, regain my kingdom. Really? Debbie told police that Starfire had won her trust with fantastic tales and promises to make her his princess. Anything you want, because you're the princess. You can have anything in the entire kingdom. It's like he made the fairy yeah. tale, and yeah. Strider really created a fantasy world for a lot of people. And for me, it was the fantasy that was sort of where I really wanted to be in life, not where I was. And it obviously wasn't just an isolated incident. I had to come forward not only to give validity to the other girl's claims, but also just to try and prevent this from happening to somebody else. Although Starfire was arrested, he was later released without bail to wait for his trial. And then just 10 days before the trial was due to begin, Starfire vanished. We have a lot of people come up missing or drowned in the Snake River, but I, in my 13 years experience, I've never had one like this. What time did you put the boat in the water this morning? Did Strider Starfire stage his own disappearance? When police examined the boat, it was dry, and it didn't appear to have been in the water that day. All the fishing gear on board was clean and neatly stowed away. Inside Starfire's pickup, they found the fishing license in the name of Daniel Chafe, which turned out to be Starfire's real name. Police also learned that others knew Strider Starfire as Curtis Jacoby. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Starfire is alive and well. I don't believe Mr. Starfire was ever on that boat. I don't believe he was ever on that river. I believe he's hoping that at some point, hopefully all this will just go away and he can lead on with a happy life. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. Daniel Chafe, a.k.a. Strider Starfire, a.k.a. Curtis Jacoby, managed to elude authorities for 15 years before he was finally captured in Montana. 
Chafe was wanted on several charges of rape and sexual abuse of minors. Chafe pled guilty to four of the charges and after plea bargaining was sentenced to five and one half years in prison. Next, the brutal double murder of a mother and son in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. It's just two days before Christmas. The Dallas County Sheriff's Department is setting the table, preparing for their holiday lunch. I'd like to, but I need to get back on the streets. It's gonna be good. Uh, it's a day that no one in the department will ever forget. Officer Roy Baird was still on duty, patrolling an area 10 miles outside Dallas. A car parked on the wrong side of a dirt road caught his attention. On the back seat was a pile of Christmas gifts. On the front seat, a blue sports bag, a pair of women's gloves, and a purse. Officer Baird concluded that someone was in trouble. I felt that there was possibly a rape going on or that a female had been raped. I then called for cover and made my entrance into the field on the north side of the road. I observed a small boy crumpled to the ground and lying next to him was a white female that was covered with a blanket. I touched him and his body was still warm. I felt that whoever did this was possibly still in the area. Later that day, the victims were identified as 30-year-old Roxanne Jeeves and her five-year-old son, Christopher. The police in Dallas were shocked by these brutal killings. Solving this mystery became a high priority for detectives. But more than two decades would pass before they got their first solid lead. Roxanne Jeeves had moved to Dallas with Christopher after a divorce. She worked for an insurance company, enjoyed country western dancing, and was engaged to be remarried. Friends described Christopher as happy and an outgoing child. He had turned five years old on December 23rd, the very same day that he was murdered. Where are you going? That morning, Roxanne and Christopher had planned to make a Christmas trip to visit relatives in Kansas. Concerned that their car might break down on the long journey, Roxanne took along her toolbox. An hour before the murders, a man that police believe was the killer was seen by a neighbor outside of Roxanne's apartment with a female companion. It was the first of many eyewitness reports that helped investigators piece together what happened to Roxanne and Christopher. We located a neighbor of Roxanne's who left about the time that Christopher came out the door with the red toolbox. Matter of fact, she spoke to Christopher. In the process of going to her car, she saw the man carrying the toolbox in one hand and Christopher by the hand as they went around the corner where she believed Roxanne's car was parked. She said they looked rough, nervous. She described them uh, as not fitting in the complex. Check under your hood. The next time the suspect was spotted, he was with Roxanne and Christopher in their car. The woman seen near the apartment was no longer with them. He was acting kind of nervous. He never looked up at me. He never said anything. You could tell that she was nervous, and when I looked her, she looked me right in the eyes, and you could tell that something was wrong. And her little boy was in the back seat, and I thought, well, he acts like everything is all right. Thank you very much. I told one of my fellow employees, I said, it's going to be something if something happens to that woman because she acted awful strange. Sometime during the next half hour, Roxanne and Christopher were murdered. I'm afraid that she saw her son killed, and then she and the killer had quite a struggle before she was initially shot twice herself. Just as other deputies arrived at the scene, a witness reported seeing the suspect running across a field. 
A total of eight witnesses saw the killer either running or hitchhiking away from the scene. Meanwhile, less than a mile away, investigators were combing the area for evidence. They got lucky. The killer had left behind his blue sports pack, and it was full of clues. Inside the bag, deputies found a pre-World War II holster, possibly a collector's item, a set of burglary tools, a brown knit cap, and finally, a bottle of formaldehyde. It would be the first hint that the murders were linked to drugs. Ooh. It was popular among heavy drug users then to lace a marijuana cigarette with formaldehyde. Uh, locally here, they called it a Sherman stick. After the murder, callers flooded police hotlines with tips. Many of them made the same suggestion. Talk to Roxanne's brother, Army Private Kurt Jeeves. Police soon learned that just before he joined the Army, Kurt had been staying with Roxanne and Christopher in their apartment. They also learned that Roxanne seemed relieved when he left. We know that he was dealing in marijuana, and at some point in time, he had a disagreement with these folks over some of their uh, transactions uh, with regard to this marijuana. According to Roxanne's friends, a man showed up at her apartment late one night. Where's Kurt? Kurt's not here. What do you mean he's not here? Police now believe that when Kurt left to join the army, he also left behind an angry customer. Roxanne may have been trapped in the middle of a bitter dispute over drugs. Kurt owed me some money, and I'm gonna find him. Two years later, Roxanne's brother, Kurt, had been murdered during a drug buy. He had always insisted that he knew nothing about who might have killed his sister and nephew. This case occurred at Christmas time, and I'm sure that myself and all the other detectives will never forget what we saw out there that day. Whomever committed that offense doesn't need to be free in our society, and I don't intend to ever give up trying to find that person. Update. 22 years after Roxanne and Christopher were murdered, a man named George Washington Hicks was convicted of the killings. Police had recovered a strand of human hair from the cap that was left in Roxanne's car on the day of the murder. The DNA from the hair sample was compared with DNA from convicts serving time in Texas state prisons. Hicks was the identical match. At the time, he was serving an 80-year sentence for sexual assault and two 15-year terms for assault and robbery. After being convicted for the murders of Roxanne and Christopher, Hicks was sentenced to life in prison. This sentence will not begin until at least 2024, when he completes his existing terms. Next, a 20th century miracle that converted many skeptics into believers. Fatima, Portugal. The Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima is visited by more than four million people every year. It is said that on this very spot in 1917, the Virgin Mary appeared to three young children. At the time, Lucia Santos was 10 years old. She and her two younger cousins, Jacinta and Francisco Martu, worked as shepherds near the small town of Fatima. Their story began on Sunday, May 13th, 1917. Lucia Santos and her cousins had taken their sheep to an area known as the Cova de Area, land owned by Lucia's family. As the flock grazed, the children began to play. They were building a little wall around a tree when there was a flash of light. And Lucia thought the flash was a sign of rain. She thought that it was lightning. So she said, let's go home so we don't get caught by the rain. When the children saw a second flash of lightning, 
they realized it meant more than rain. According to Lucia, the glowing figure said that she was from heaven. O que é que você me sempre quer? Vim para pedir-vos que vinhais aqui seis meses seguidos no dia 13, esta mesma hora. Depois vos direi quem sou e o que quero. E eu também vou para o céu? Vais sim. E a Jacinta? The lady promised to return several times, always on the 13th of the month. She also asked the children to be her messengers, but warned them to expect great hardships. Although word of the vision spread quickly, not everyone was inspired by the rumors. In fact, Lucia's mother was furious at her daughter's involvement. Que mentiras andas para aí a dizer? Então andas a dizer que viste uma senhora do céu? Quem disse isso foi a Jacinta e não foi tia. Pois tu com isso. Her mother punished her every now and again. Shah Martu, Lucia's cousin, was a young boy at the time. It wasn't that her mother was bad, but she wanted to have her daughter to say that this was a lie. But Lucia kept saying, how can I say it was a lie if I actually saw her? For Lucia, the suffering predicted by the lady had begun. But even in the face of her mother's anger, she returned with her cousins to the Cova di Area on the appointed day, June 13th. They were joined by some 50 villagers, drawn by rumors of the impending visitation. Once again, the three children claimed the lady from heaven appeared to them. As in the first visitation, only Lucia spoke to the vision. Although some said that a strange cloud of light was visible, no one else saw the lady from heaven. When news of the second visitation reached Lucia's mother, she was outraged. She believed that her daughter was part of a hoax. Her mother said, you're going to go to the priest and you're going to confess to him in front of the altar in the church that you lie. When confronted by the local priest, Lucia refused to discuss what she had seen. Given the time and place, this was a startling act of disobedience. Later in life, Lucia wrote about the episode. As I heard people say that the devil always brings conflict and disorder, I began to think that truly, ever since I had started seeing these things, our home was no longer the same, for joy and peace had fled. What anguish I felt. July 13th, 1917, the appointed day for the third appearance. By now, word of the miraculous visions had spread across Portugal and neighboring Spain. Pilgrims clogged the roads leading to the cova. At 12 noon, the mysterious vision appeared once more, but once again, it was only visible to the three children. The Lady from Heaven reminded Lucia to return at noon on the 13th day of each month. She also promised that on her sixth appearance, she would perform a miracle for all to see and believe. The lady then presented a terrifying vision of hell, a vision that Lucia later described in her memoirs. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. Lucia claimed that her vision of hell was the lady's warning 
that God was offended by the conflict in Europe. World War I was then in its third year. Although the lady predicted that the war would end soon, she said that it would be replaced by a more serious conflict, a war with Russia. Lucia said the lady from heaven revealed one more prophecy, but made her promise not to reveal it. One month later, the promise would be severely tested. August 13th, the day of the fourth appearance, a local government official offered to take the three children to the Kova. <laughs> Lucia and her cousins were whisked away to a government prison, nine miles from Fatima. The town official was convinced that the children's vision was a hoax and he was certain that he could extract the truth from young Lucia. The children were held and tormented for three days. Outside the prison walls, their family and friends gathered to express their outrage. In spite of the harsh tactics, 10-year-old Lucia kept her promise to the lady from heaven. Officials admitted their failure, and the children were finally allowed to return home. According to Sister Lucia, the lady from heaven appeared a fourth time and a fifth, just as predicted. As the date for the sixth appearance approached, excitement built. Coming up, startling eyewitness accounts of the legendary miracle at Fatima. October 13th, 1917. The day of the long-awaited miracle was wet and miserable. Thousands descended on Fatima. These photographs show some of the estimated 70,000 people who gathered with the hope of witnessing a divine vision. Many had come from hundreds of miles away. Soon after Lucia arrived at the Cova di Iria, the rain suddenly stopped. The huge crowd included both the curious and the faithful. A handful of reporters from the major newspapers squeezed in among them. The local priest, fearing a public fiasco that would embarrass the church, was one of the most vocal doubters. The crowd grew silent as Lucia began to speak, although to onlookers, it appeared that she was talking into thin air. I tinha muitas coisas para lhe pedir. A cura dos doentes e a conversão dos pecadores. Eu peço perdão pelos seus pecados. Olhem para o sol. Eyewitnesses reported that the sun began to move and rays of multicolored light were seen shooting across the sky. Then suddenly, the sun seemed to fall. The crowd went silent until the sun abruptly reversed course and returned to its rightful place in the sky. The miracle of the sun at Fatima is certainly the most spectacular physical manifestation, uh, physical miracle that has been associated with Our Lady. She had to manifest her um, presence in a grand manner, in a very convincing and spectacular manner, because it was important that people all over the world should believe uh, what she had said. According to witnesses, the amazing display lasted for 12 minutes. People as far away as 600 miles from Fatima reported seeing the event. And yet some eyewitnesses at the Kova claim they saw absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. 
But for some skeptics, the spectacular accounts at Fatima were real. Evelina de Alameda, the editor of a government-controlled newspaper, became a believer that day. At the hour foretold, the rain ceased to fall. The dense mass of clouds parted, and the sun began to whirl around in a wild and violent dance with such lovely, glowing colors passing successively over the sun's surface. Over the years, the miracle at Fatima became the subject of considerable debate. Some dismissed the events as a textbook case of mass hysteria, but others interpreted the large number of eyewitness accounts as credible evidence that a miracle had occurred. Today, a basilica stands where Lucia and her cousins claimed to have seen the Lady from Heaven. In 1930, the Catholic Church recognized the events at Fatima as a miracle worthy of belief. Lucia's younger cousins both died during a worldwide flu epidemic within three years of the visions. Many believe their deaths fulfilled the Lady's promise that the children would soon be called to heaven. Soon after her cousins passed away, 14-year-old Lucia Santush retreated to the safety of a convent. For most of her life, she remained behind cloistered walls. Lucia died in 2005 at the age of 97. The day of her funeral was declared a national day of mourning in Portugal. Over the decades, Fatima's call to the faithful has grown even more powerful. The tide of pilgrims has swelled from the thousands who joined Lucia in 1917 to several million in recent years. Even those who remain skeptical of miracles are mystified by the events at Fatima and the 10-year-old girl whom many believe was chosen to be God's messenger. While there were some who admired me and considered me a saint, there were always others who called me a hypocrite and a sorceress. They are all mistaken. I am not a saint, and I am not a liar. Only God knows what I am. Sister Lucia promised the Virgin Mary that she would never reveal the secret prophecy. The Vatican also insisted that she not speak about her experience without permission. Sister Lucia took the secret of Fatima to her grave. Next, a millionaire who became a father during a youthful love affair tries to find his long-lost daughter, the heir to his fortune. We recently featured the story of W.B. Mac McDonald, a self-made millionaire who was searching for his long-lost heir a child whom Mac had seen only once, more than 50 years before. Pomona, California, 1948. When Mac was 18, he fell in love with a 16-year-old girl named Mary Helen Carr. But her mother disapproved of their relationship and threatened to have Mac arrested if their romance continued. So he decided to leave town. Three weeks later, Mary Helen ran away from home to join Mac in Houston. Got a new neighbor. You did? Pretending to be husband and wife, the young lovers moved in together, but their happiness didn't last long. Just a minute. Who was it? I don't know. Mac received a call from a friend Hello? who said that the police were on their way to the apartment. Authorities carried warrants charging Mac with statutory rape. That's fine. That's fine. I'll call you. Mac made his escape with no time to spare. I was devastated again. They jerked her back to uh, California, and I hadn't. I had no way of contacting her again. A year had passed, and Mac returned to California for a new job. One evening. He and a friend stopped off at a drive-in in Long Beach. Mac? Mary? 
Mac was shocked to learn that he was a father. He visited Mary Helen and met his child for the first and only time. Fearing that police were still looking for him, he left after only five minutes. He never even learned if the baby was a boy or a girl. Mac is now a wealthy businessman and wants to find the child that he'd left behind. I feel that the youngster's entitled to my estate, and I'd want that youngster to know that I love them and I want them to have the best. The night of our broadcast, Mac McDonald learned that he had a daughter named Sherry. The long-awaited news came from a viewer in Texas, Mary Helen Carr, Sherry's mother. One week after the story aired, Mac arrived at Sherry's home in Denver, Colorado. No. Hi. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> it's hard to describe the feeling that I had for my daughter when I opened the door and she was there and I was able to hold her. I said, I don't want to hold you. At this point in my life, to find that there is someone who is my father and who wants to establish a relationship with me, it's just emotionally very traumatic. I just tried to come to the realization that it really was my father standing there. And I just, you know, does he, does he look like me? Does he act like me? You know, I have all these things I need to learn about him. The fact that I didn't stay and fight the battle, it's most unfortunate. I don't believe I would do it that way again. However, yesterday, unfortunately, can't be redone. No matter how you look at it, he left my mother with a, with a tiny baby, you know, and I have to deal with that. I have to deal with the fact that I have a father who loves for me, who has raised me, who has cared for me, but I believe there's enough room in this family for everyone, and I sincerely mean that. Mac McDonald's search for his long-lost daughter has come to an end, and he is determined to never lose touch with her again. Ashboro, North Carolina. James Donald King, a convicted murderer, is released from prison. King has served only six years of a life sentence for killing his wife, but is granted an early parole for good behavior. Prosecutors in nearby Greensboro challenge the parole board's ruling. They argue strongly that King is a vicious killer and his early release could have deadly consequences. James King grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, the oldest of 12 children. He was an honor student and a senior class president at his high school. King got to hanging around the wrong crowd. The man we'll call Gordon was a high school classmate of James King. He is now an undercover law enforcement agent. These guys that he was hanging around with had been in uh, trouble with the law in the past, and uh, I think they had a lot of influence over him. 20 years later, King was a different person. He was an angry man in a dismal marriage. He and his wife, Shirley, fought constantly. I need to talk to you. Shirley, I need to talk to you. Why do you keep turning your back on me? Listen, I'm getting tired. Don't you dare! Shirley King died instantly. James King was found by the police the next morning, less than a mile away, sound asleep in a car. King pleaded guilty to first degree murder and was sentenced to life. All right, break time. During his first four years in jail, King was a model prisoner. And then while working on a chain gang, he made a bold split second decision. King stayed on the run and avoided capture for nine years. Police finally received a tip that he was working as a janitor in Boston. He was arrested without incident and returned to prison in North Carolina. Two years later, the parole board made a startling decision. 
Based upon King's productive life and his law-abiding behavior while he was an escaped convict, they ruled that he was eligible for early release due to good time credit. When I learned of the attempts to have Mr. King parole, I wrote a letter to the parole board strenuously objecting to him even being considered for parole. I didn't feel uh, serving six years on life sentence for first degree murder was anything close to sufficient. In spite of the objections, James Donald King became a free man once again. Less than a year after his parole, King married Gloria Cornelius, a nursing home worker with three children from a previous marriage. Within a few months, the destructive pattern of his first marriage began to repeat itself. Where have you been? I've been working. Working? You're two hours late. King was drinking heavily and began to physically abuse Gloria. Don't touch me. Finally, she walked out on him. Three months later, Gloria was playing bingo with friends in downtown Greensboro. At midnight, King showed up. Gloria, I need to talk to you. I don't have anything to say to you. Come on, I really need to talk to you. I'll be back. 30 minutes later, Greensboro police found the body of Gloria King. She had been shot five times. Once again, James Donald King was on the run. When I heard that Gloria had been killed and that King was the suspect, I felt that the parole board was the main culprit because if they had followed the rules and guidelines of the court system properly, Gloria may still be alive. Update. James King was arrested in Dayton, Ohio, thanks to a tip from one of our viewers. At the time, he was working in a metal foundry. James King was tried and convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. <laughs>